those silos that come up between different individuals. And you know, some of the common use cases we see is um, you know, anything an operator can do manually, Ansible can automate, you know, things like backup and restore of devices, upgrading network devices, um, ensuring configuration compliance, applying patches, uh, generating dynamic documentation. Now that's actually, a, it's, it's a very subtle feature, but it's huge in what it does. What I mean by that is, so Ansible has a module that allows us to give information about the systems that we're looking at. So for example, if you were to point Ansible at a server and you were to execute this specific module, it has the ability to produce all of the information about that server. What is its IP address? What's its MAC address? What's its host name? You know, the, the information that comes back is actually several pages long. So if you think about that deeply, if you have an inventory of several thousand network devices or servers in your server farm, and you want to be able to produce a report that talks about every single one of those devices and gives all of the data about that device, you can do that with Ansible with one command, one command that points to your list of your, your inventory of servers that are available. And you're probably asking yourself the question, how does it work? How does Ansible communicate with network devices or uh, server machines. And there's actually two scenarios that, that we explain. The, the first scenario is network devices. With a network device, it literally executes behind the scenes, it executes the command line interface of that network device. So it, it basically communicates to that device directly from your control node. The way it's different when you're communicating with a Linux or a Windows type server is Ansible actually creates an SSH connection out to that server. It copies whatever tasks or code that it wants to execute to that server. It executes the code, deletes the code, and then returns. So it's definitely a different paradigm if you compare the two different types of devices or environments. So let's talk a little bit about how the Ansible playbook works. So again, playbooks are written in YAML, and the playbooks are going to contain a list of tasks which get executed sequentially. And those tasks are going to execute what we call a module. And today we have over 4,000 modules that Ansible can execute. Modules that do things on core operating systems, on networks, and even in the community. And the reason I say we have over 4,000 is, again, I want to take you back to the fact that we're an open source company. And by definition, that means that people have the ability to write code and to contribute into our upstream source code repository. At last count, we had 4,000 modules, but people are contributing new ones every single day. In fact, when I first started talking about Ansible a couple of years ago, we only had 3,000 modules. So in a very short amount of time, we've added over a thousand modules to our list of things that we can do. So the modules are a very big part of the Ansible playbook. And the last but not least is we have plugins. You know, the plugins are the gears in the engine. These things that plug into various pieces of our puzzle that allow us to communicate and do things against them. Now, if I may, I just want to show you Ansible at its simplest form. And that is Ansible at the command line. This is an example where you see at the bottom, it says Ansible all minus M ping. The word all conveys to Ansible that we want it to process against all of the hosts that are contained in our inventory. And in this case, the minus M, which stands for module, says that we want to execute the ping command against every single one of those hosts. So physically what happens on our management node, the management node will create an SSH connection to every host that's in the inventory, and it's simply going to ping it, asking the question, are you alive? Are you, are you responding to requests? Taking this one step further, we, we introduce into the equation a playbook. And again, a playbook is just a, a, it's a YAML file, and again, we still have what's called a host inventory file. 
And in this case, there's only one host in the inventory file. So when we run the Ansible playbook command, giving it the actual ASCII file containing our, our YAML code, it's going to SSH to that host, and it's going to execute every task that's in that playbook. Now, you're probably wondering, you know, give me an example of what an inventory file looks like. Again, it's very simple. This is its most simplest form, a text file. Um, the inventory file is going to simply contain a list of all of the servers, all the hosts or network devices that we want to communicate with, that we want to control. And you can break these, these hosts into groups. And the way that you do that is by, you see at the top, for example, I have a left square bracket, the word web, and a right square bracket. That means that anything that comes after that is going to be part of that group. So we have a group called web with two servers, and we have a group called DB servers with two servers. And the way that that works in a playbook, this is an example playbook where we're going to install an Apache web server. The very first parameter we give it is the list of hosts that we want to process this playbook against. And again, this goes back into our inventory file. It finds either a host with the name web, or in this case, it's going to be a group of hosts with the name web. So it's going to process this playbook against, in this case, two servers, because that's how many servers were in the web group. Now, we have the ability to define environment variables. We can even tell it what remote user do we want to log in against when we access these servers. Now, of course, there are other parameters we can provide. For example, there's a remote password parameter. Probably wouldn't be very smart to put that in your playbook because that would be in clear text, but you could do it. But in this case, what we're going to do is when we, when we do an SSH to that server and we log in as root, we've actually created uh, SSH keys, which get communicated between the two hosts that give us access between them. So again, we don't need to give it the, the password in this particular case. Now, in this playbook, we've got three tasks that we want to do. We want to install the Apache web server. And to do that, we're going to use the yum command, because that's exactly how you would do it if you were sitting at the command line. You'd say yum install, uh, and you'd give it a package, HTTPD, and it would be off to the races, and it would, it would install that package. Step two, or task number two, is we want, to, we want to write a configuration file out to this server. And to do that, we have a module called template. Template takes a source file that we want to copy from and a destination file that we want to copy it into, and it actually copies it between our control host and our destination host. And then finally, we want to start that Apache server. And to do that, we use a module called service. And service, is, it's nothing more than if you were to use the systemctl command on your rel box. So it's going to give you the name of the service that you want to start. In this case, what, what, what um, status do you want it to be? Do you want it to be running? Do you want it to stop? Do you want to restart it? Those are all different parameters that it takes. And again, if you, if you put this into a much larger context, in other words, if you have a playbook with multiple posts in the inventory, what you can see is it's going to go out to every single one of these hosts, and it's going to execute every single one of those tasks. Now, what's interesting about it is you have to ask yourself the question, what happens if it fails? What happens if you've got three tasks and a second task fails? Maybe it only fails on one server out of 20. Ansible actually tracks that. It tracks exactly what hosts you ran your, your playbook on, and if there were any failures, it will track that. It gives you the ability to go out to that host, fix whatever's wrong, and then come back and run your playbook again. And in that case, when, it run, when you run the playbook a second time, it's only going to run that one task that needs to be completed on that one host. All of the other servers will have already retained their state, and, and it knows not to do anything else to them. So it's very efficient. On top of that, there's a, there's a way to configure Ansible to say, I want to do, let's say, two or three or 20 of these hosts all simultaneously. So it has the ability to spawn out, create a thread, start up 20 threads for 20 hosts, run all of your tasks, 
against those hosts and then do the next 20 and the next 20. So that way it, it basically speeds up your processing time because it's not single threaded. Now to talk again about some of the different modules we have, again, there's over 4,000 of them. Um, we have modules for copying and doing things against files and uh, using like get repositories and things like that. If you wanted to see all of the modules that we have, you can go to docs.ansible.com. And from this picture, you can see that you can find modules on the cloud or clustering, crypto, databases, um, identity and inventory. There's a lot. There's a lot of things that you can access. However, if you're in development mode and you're sitting on your, 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 your Linux server and you're writing your Ansible playbooks and you simply want to look up a particular module, you can do that with the Ansible dash dot command. You can, take, you can say dash L, which says give me all of them, list all of them, or you can specify individual commands like the copy command. Now, in the event that maybe out of the 4,000 modules that we have, we do not have a module for whatever it is that you want to do, well, of course, we have something called the command module. So the command module can be used to take just a typical operating system command that you would type on the keyboard, and you can pass that in as a parameter to Ansible. And of course, there's a variety of different ways to do this. You can put it into a shell, you can create a script, or you can actually have the raw command that you use. Again, here's some examples of different commands in Ansible. You've already seen the first one where it's gonna ping all the servers. The second one is actually really interesting, and this is the one where it provides a list of all of the information about that server. The module is called setup, and Again, if you point it at a host or at an inventory of hosts, you can produce all the information about those hosts. And this is an example of what you see. You know, so you, if you say Ansible localhost minus m setup, again, you can see the IP address, the alias, the gateway, the MAC address. You know, there's hundreds of different pieces of information that we provide, including operating system and things of that nature. And again, if you want to look at all the different use cases, again, here's a list of some of the different modules that we have. We have cloud modules, virtual container modules. I mean, you name it, it's out there. Um, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be shocked if there wasn't something out there that would help you do the things that you want to do. But let me wrap up with this last slide. This talks a little bit about your return on investment at the Ansible. And specifically, if you leverage Ansible, Ansible Tower, what we've seen is that in less than three months, you're going to get a 146% return on your investment. And on the left, it shows some of the example scenarios that we have. For example, uh, let's say you have a security incident, and you have created Ansible playbooks that allow you to configure your security to, let's say, set log parameters to turn on log parameters. You know, take, for example, denial of service attack. If somebody's trying to pound your network and bring it to its knees, the way that system administrators fix that is first they have to turn on logging because what, what happens is they get an alert. And the alert says, hey, somebody's trying to crash your system. But in order to figure out who that person is, they have to go turn on logging parameters. So again, you can have an Ansible playbook that goes into whatever your administrative tool is, your security tool is, and it says, turn on logging. And in that playbook, maybe it would say, turn on this specific piece of information that I wanna see. And sometimes that logging information comes from multiple sources that you then have to tie together into one logging source. Ansible can automate that entire process. And then when you have figured out What's the IP address that's giving me this denial of service? Well, the next step is you want to apply rules, firewall rules, to all of your server, servers to say block this IP address. And again, think about being able to automate that. You, you know the IP address. You, you have a list of all of your host inventory, your, your network devices. 
run one script to tell them to all block that IP address. You can see very quickly how you can save 94% or, or get a 94% reduction in recovery time following a security incident. You think about 84% savings by deploying workloads systems and appliances using Tower. Again, I mean, I've, I've been in this world before where you need, let's say, to create a test environment or a production environment. And again, how do people do that in the past? They, somebody creates instructions that somebody follows. If you're lucky, those instructions have some automated tasks. But if you can take that and automate the entire delivery of that system from provisioning to deployment of your application to modification of configuration files, you can see that you can very quickly get an 84% savings in doing that. And then finally, a 67% reduction in man hours required for customer deliveries, taking all of those different customers that you have and automating their processes. That gives you a huge leg up in being able to, to automate these things. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause uh, and I'm gonna turn this over to my esteemed colleague from Moser. Um, I'm gonna let him finish with an example of things that they have done with Ansible with one of their customers. So let me turn off sharing. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Hunrahan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Hanrahan, and I'm a principal consultant at Moser Consulting. And I'm also the Linux uh, Unix lead on a government on a government contract that deals with healthcare. So um, on our contract, we have about twenty or twenty or thirty Apache servers running uh, various applications. And um, hey, Chris, Chris, uh -huh. you may want to you may want to share your screen again. I saw your presentation for a minute, but now I'm just seeing your background. So you may want to, oh, there it is. Yep, I see it now. Okay, apparently I have to have it on the monitor that I shared it from, so. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so uh, 30 Apache servers. Um, we recently did a tech refresh effort that moved us from Solaris Spark to Red Hat Linux Intel on VMware. And so um, one of the things that I wanted to do when we did that was, um, use some automation to try and manage our Apache environment. So um, we've got several several applications that we use Apache for. We have a learning management system. We have a content management system. Uh, we use the um, Atlassian suite, so Jira, Bitbucket, and Bamboo. Um, our, Apache in, our Apache is running um, mod SSL um, and mod security, which is an application firewall. And then a couple of them run the WebLogic plugin. So we've got a, a variety of Apache configurations. And then we also have several environments. We have production, test, integration, and then finally development. So between all those environments and all those applications, we have about 30 Apache servers um, to manage. So the way that we used to do this, um, when we were running uh, Solaris Spark um, and didn't have automation is we did it the way that most people probably do it. Um, we compiled Apache from source so that we would have the latest and greatest Apache code. Um, we had, a, we had before our tech refresh, we did have a little bit of Linux. So we had mostly Solaris Spark and a couple of Red Hat 6 Intel's physical servers. So, um, we managed Apache configuration via the files that are stored on each individual server. So, for example, if I have uh, the LMS application and I have um, a prod, a test, uh, an integration, and a dev server, then that's four separate instances of that one application on four physical uh, servers. So, um, you can see that you know, keeping, if I have to make a single configuration change, I have to make it four times exactly the same way. I have to remember that I have four servers and not three. Um, and so it, that can get, you know, with 
over 30 servers in, in four different environments um, and multiple applications that can, that can become quite tedious and most, most importantly, time consuming and error prone. So um, typically when I created a new Apache server for something, I tended to copy an old one and then make changes to the configuration to set it up for the new one and then test those changes to make sure that they work. Um, so uh, the configuration files for Apache mod security um, tend to be different for each environment. Some of the security rules have application names or server names in them and or URLs in them. So for example, the um, mod security file for my De development environment is going to be different from my mod security file in my test environment simply because the development environment has a different URL and that URL is part of the <coughs> part of the rule set um, that mod security uses. So um, I have to have, if I want to make a change to the mod security file, I cannot simply copy the file from development to test to integration to production. I have to make that same change to the individual file on the individual server. Um, and then finally, a server rebuild could take hours and involve a restore of files from backup, um, which, you know, can, if you, if you're using offsite backups or something like that, that could take a while to, you know, to get your hands on the, on the most recent backup that you need to do the restore. So um, after our tech refresh, we decided to use, um, because everything was now running Red Hat Linux, we decided to use uh, the Red Hat Linux package for Apache rather than compiling from source. Um, and I created, what I did was I created an Apache role, um, which is similar to a playbook. A playbook can actually call a role. And um, I, so I created an Apache role to install each variant of Apache that I needed for each of my applications and each of my um, different environments. And then I would simply instruct the role, you know, set some variables in the, in the playbook that calls the role to tell the role, okay, I'm installing a dev LMS web server here. So here's the parameters that you need for that. And the role um, handles the installation, update, configuration, of the, of the entire Apache server from setting the local Linux firewall rules to installing certificates, setting up logging, um, setting up syslog, everything. All the things that I had to remember to do or make sure were done myself by hand, um, the role handles automatically for me without me having to think about it. And I think Jim, touched on uh, templates. So if, if any of you have ever configured Apache, you know that it's, it's got a really big, um, several big configuration files. Those configuration files are gonna be different, like I mentioned, for each application, each environment. So I used um, a feature of uh, Ansible called templating to create one configuration file in the configuration file is logic that says, if this is an LMS file, use this. If this is a content management or content management web server, use this. So um, if I have to make a change across all web servers, for example, if I have to set a different header for a security, a security vulnerability or something like that, I can make the change once in a template and then run the, run the playbook and have, it, have that change pushed out to all 30 of my web servers. Um, one of the things that, um, this isn't really a feature of Ansible, but it's highly encouraged is that all of my playbook, playbooks and roles and templates are stored in Git for source control. Um, that's a, certainly a big help. It allows me to, you know, if I make a mistake configuring something, it allows me to go back in, in time and pull up a version of the playbook or the, or the role or the template you know, prior to the mistake being made and, and figure out what I did wrong. So um, for me to build a new server, um, assuming that I have a freshly configured uh, VMware Red Hat, Red Hat Linux 7 instant VM built, 
it takes me 10 minutes to install configure Apache, something that used to take me, I would say at least two hours per server to do. Um, and, and there's no chance that I'm gonna miss a step because it's all defined in the role in the playbook. Um, it's gonna run the same way and do the same things every time. Um, and then there's a, <clears throat> there's a term that you'll often hear associated with Ansible called I, I, idempotent. And what that means is that when I run my playbook, I'm always gonna get the same result. So for example, if let's say that um, I need to make a change to my mod security configuration file on uh, an Apache server, and that's all I need to do. I don't need to install it. I don't need to configure any of the other stuff. I can simply run the entire playbook and it'll go through each step and it'll check and see if that, if that, the task has, if that task has already been done, it won't try to do it again. So um, it, for example, if when it, in, in the step where it applies the Apache configuration file, it'll attempt to apply it and it'll compare what it's about to apply with what's already on the server. And if they match, then it doesn't make, it doesn't make the change it simply reports that that step is complete in Ansible. So you can see what's, what was changed and what was not changed. So I can run the entire playbook, not worrying whether it's gonna affect anything. It's only gonna change the thing that I want to be changed. Um, so because the source for the role and playbook are all stored in Bitbucket, changes are documented, which is, um, really nice. Um, whenever I make a change in Git, I have to, I have to do what's called a commit message so I can explain in my commit message exactly what I changed and why. Um, doing it the old way with simply making a backup of a configuration file and naming the old file after the date that you changed it doesn't accomplish the same thing. So this, this is really nice to have. Um, there's a feature in, um, Ansible called tagging. You can assign each ta each task and if you want to a tag. And so if I, for example, going back again to the uh, my example of having to make a change to the mod security uh, configuration file, if I only want to run that one step in the playbook and I don't want to run the rest of the steps, I can simply pass a parameter to Ansible that says, hey, just run this tag and it'll simply run that one step in the playbook and then finish without going through all the other steps. That's a nice feature. Um, it allows me to, to surgically do just one thing in a playbook. <clears throat> um, I think I may have mentioned this before, but uh, doing things this way with Ansible makes sure that I don't miss a step when I configure a web server. Um, that's pretty important because if you're doing this from memory or even if you're even if you're following a document, you know, sometimes it's easy to just overlook a step or wonder if you already did that step or not and then have to go back and check. Ansible removes all that. The steps are documented in the playbook or in the role and you can simply execute the playbook or role. It gives you um, output from each task that it runs to let you know whether it was done or not. And then um, if you move on to the tower environment, you might be able to say one of the one of the things that tower solves is that did I run that playbook or not? Did I run that role on this web server or didn't I? Well, tower saves the output from every playbook um, execution. So you can go back and look at the history of that of the times that you've run that playbook and see what you know what you ran it against and what the results were and it saves that. So that's really nice to have too. So um, we had one situation um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, um, after patching, we had a server start up and, and run, but Apache won't serve any content. And when I looked at the system, lo system logs, it revealed that we were having some kind of SE Linux problem, which if any of you have ever encountered SE Linux problems, um, they can be tough to solve. And so um, 
disabling, I could disable SE Linux and that resolved my problem, but I can't, you know, because of the regulations for the contract that I'm on, I cannot leave SE Linux disabled, even on a development server, it has to be running. So um, pre-Ansible, I would have to, I would pretty much have to restore from tape, tape backup. And, you know, that could be an arduous process, it could take hours, especially if you have to wait for a tape from offsite. However, what I did this time was I simply created um, a new Red Hat 7 uh, VM and I ran my, ran, moved the IP addresses over to it and ran my playbook against it. And 10 minutes later, I was back up and running without my problem. So that enables me to go back to that old server and you know, open a case with Red Hat support and work with them to figure out what went wrong with the patch and why it happened. But in the meantime, um, Ansible enabled me to get my get my server back up and running, knowing that it was configured and set up exactly the same way as the original. So um, I know that was a lot. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? Okay, Jim. I think that's it. Um, so if there are no questions, we can uh, give you 15 minutes back unless uh, Matt or Melinda, did you have anything final to say? Uh, no, I, just if there's any questions, type them in uh, to the chat pod. Uh, if, we don't, if we don't see it before we go, we'll collect them and uh, put out a, uh, a follow-up email with any uh, responses to any questions. Thank you all for coming. Um, we will send out an email with a recording. I missed the first few minutes of the recording, but we will get the rest of it there. And, um, and so you can watch that if you missed anything or if you wanna revisit anything. And um, that's it for today. Thank you very much. <laughs>